Uh, but up next, well, it's an important interview. Uh, did you know if you're diagnosed with brain cancer, you have only a 23% chance of surviving for five more years? And not only is this such an insidious disease, it, it actually affects far more men than women. But why? Well, we're going to speak with the head of research at the Cure Brain Cancer Foundation with an important message you won't want to miss. There is absolutely no doubt that brain cancer would have to be the most feared diagnosis and probably Australia's most vicious killers, one of them. And if you're diagnosed with brain cancer, listen to this, you just have a 23% chance of surviving for just five years. But did you know brain cancer is a disease that disproportionately affects men over women? In 2022, almost 1,200 Australian men were diagnosed with brain cancer compared to just over 700 women. I I had no idea about that. And almost 1,000 men died compared to just under 600 women, which I guess makes sense. But why is this? And what new technologies are available right now to help treat this insidious disease? Now, we're lucky tonight. We've got Dr. Hamza Anwar. He's the head of research at the Cure Brain Cancer Foundation. Hamza, welcome to healthy living. Thank you so much. I'm great. It's great to be here. Yeah, what a great topic to talk about. I think all of us really are terrified at some point in our life that this one has come to get us. But those stats are really crazy about it affecting more men than women. I had absolutely no idea. Do we know why that's happening? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a it's a great question because so when we have a look at the the data in terms of the incidence rates, we, we can see that there's a disparity um, especially when we look at certain brain tumors, for example, glioblastoma, where the incidence is 1.5 to 2 times higher in males than in females. But finding out why or the mechanism behind this is, is actually a little tricky because there seems to be a lot of overlapping factors, for example, aspects of metabolism, differences in hormones between males and females, and, and genetics. And so we can't really pinpoint it to a single cause. But there have been some studies that have tried to answer this question. And so, for example, there was one study in 2014 that found that a certain protein that is known to reduce the risk of cancer is actually significantly less active in male brain cells than in female brain cells. And, um, you know, like th- that was well, one of the first studies that actually definitively showed why there seems to be a difference between males and females. But unfortunately, it, it, it's just very tricky because, again, there's so many overlapping factors and it's like trying to find a key that can fit in multiple locks. Absolutely. Hamza, you are a researcher yourself. Do you look also at, like, is treatment more effective on men or, or women? Does, is that, do we change the kind of treatment we give depending on your gender? Yeah, so unfortunately, there, there does seem to be this case where treatment actually does um, help females better than it helps males. And uh, so, for, for instance, um, a study in 2019 by the Washington School of Medicine they found that standard therapy, so this is therapy that's kind of all, uh, like general all around, um, when they used the chemotherapy drug known as temozolomide, which works to stop cancer cells from making DNA, it was actually more effective in females than it was in males. So there is starting to be a conversation growing around the idea of having to cater treatments to males and females very, very differently. Um, but again, it's, it's very similar to trying to answer the question of incidence because there seems to be a lot of overlapping factors and Sometimes it's hard to kind of uh, dissect what's actually causing the fact that there seems to be less treatment uh, effectiveness in males and in females. But there were some studies that showed, for example, um, differences between males and females in, in terms of metabolism. So there is a certain, uh, there's a certain, uh, so for example, there is a level of glutamine that is found in males. That it, it's, the levels are much higher in males than in females. Now, glutamine is, is essentially... Um, what the tumor, for example, in glioma, the glioblastoma tumors uses to actually survive and attain nutrients to grow. And males had, seem to have higher levels than females, and so this seems to contribute to why tumors were actually uh, forming and, and actually growing and progressing more in males than in females. But again, it's, th- there's just so many different aspects in terms of genetics, metabolism, hormones that seem to be playing a part here. It's fascinating. I've always been fascinated in the female brain, you know, particularly because we're more prone to things like depression, but also dementia. And I had no idea that when it comes to cancer, potentially the most feared diagnosis that any Australian could ever get brain cancer was such a a male problem. I did want to ask you about the symptoms of brain cancer, because I think we've all diagnosed ourselves with it at some point in our lives. What should we be looking at? And is a a low-grade headache that just sort of hangs around 
around for a few weeks. Is that a, a, something that we should worry about brain cancer? Yeah, absolutely. So a persistent or a recurring headache is actually probably the most common symptom that, that is associated with brain cancer. And usually if that's the only symptom, it's still advised to see your GP to try and figure out what's going on. But there are a cluster of other symptoms. Um, so, for example, if there's persistent or recurrent vomiting, issues with balance, issues with coordination, um, abnormal eye movements, blurred vision, behavioral changes, uh, and, and even fits or seizures. So if there is a combination of these symptoms, and that's when something serious seems to be happening underneath, and you know, we need to uh, get some specialist help. But I, I, I would advise if, if there is just one symptom, that is something that should just uh, probably start off with the GP, but if there's a combination of symptoms, that's when there needs to be a bit more specialist help. And are there any um, particular types of headaches that would worry you more um, than other types of headaches? I'm thinking about, you know, waking up with a headache in the morning or, or the headache being worse when you cough or sneeze or bend over to do your shoelaces. Are, are there, what are the red flags in terms of headaches? Well, I believe it depends on what you feel like might may have caused the headache. So for, for instance, you know, if you're dehydrated, it's a hot day, you know you haven't had much water, you could simply just um, have a headache because you're, you're dehydrated, right? So in that kind of instance, you would, you would know that, that, that there's something causing that headache. But when probably the alarm bells would ring when you, you just don't know where it's coming from and it seems to be very persistent or um, repeating itself on a daily basis. So I, I would say it has to, it, it is context dependent, but it, the, the most, the, the, the thing to look out for is, is how re- repetitive it is really and how strong the headache actually is and if it, if, if it impacts any other aspects of your of your daily living. Yeah, that's a really, really good tip. Now, Hamza, I believe there have been some pretty exciting developments with artificial, artificial intelligence looking to help cure brain cancer. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. So artificial intelligence has actually been around for a long time, but it's because we live in an age where computing power has just absolutely shot through the roof and we have such an abundance of them that we're actually able to utilize AI in, in so many different ways. So um, the way that AI has actually played an increasing role uh, in the last few years in terms of cancer is assessing cancer risk and how a disease actually progresses. So, for instance, there was a study whereby the risk scores for breast cancer over a five-year period were actually generated by AI algorithms from thousands of mammograms. And these scores were then compared to... Um, clinical risk scores that were done by a collaborative network known as the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium. And what they found was that the AI algorithms actually performed better than the, than the consortium risk models for predicting breast cancer uh, risk at zero to five years. And, I mean, th- that's just one example. So that was breast cancer. There was also some great work done in lung cancer, for, for example, where um, a recent study described uh, the development of uh, AI known as Sybil, so it's a deep learning cancer risk model that uses a single low dose chest uh, computer tomography or a CT scan to predict lung cancers occurring one to six years after a screen. And it was known to accurately predict 86 to 94 percent of the time whether a person will actually develop lung cancer. So there's a lot of exciting opportunities, a lot of exciting prospects to use AI. And I, and I feel like we've only just started and it's going to be playing a very increasing role over the next, over the next decade or so. So tell us about the Cure Brain Cancer Foundation. Um, you are a researcher there, and I love Aussie research. I think we really are underrated. We have such amazing uh, research. Tell us about some of the research that uh, Cure Brain, Brain Cancer Foundation is doing and how people can find you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in a nutshell, our mission is actually to increase survival as well as quality of life and, and ultimately find the cure. So we, we do fund a lot of different types of research. And just recently, we actually awarded uh, two early career fellowships to early career researchers who are working on um, a number of different things. So one of the researchers is actually working on Im- immunotherapy. Now, immunotherapy is when you actually harness the body's own immune system to attack cancer cells. And it's, it's actually started to gain a, a lot more traction um, now that we have a lot more uh, data, we have a lot more um, different options to work with. And one of our other fellows is actually working on drugs to also target cancer, cancer cells. So we, we do fund a, a host of different novel, powerful, um, high-quality research. And our aim is to just keep supporting the researchers who are doing the work and also try to uh, help, help essentially lower the risk for even biotechnology companies to try and invest in, in novel products that can actually be made available to brain cancer patients. 
Such great work. Uh, Dr. Hamza Anwar, thank you so much for giving us your time this evening on Healthy Living. 